please introduce yourself and then uh, your Thank question. you. I'm Kurt Jensen from the Danish Foreign Ministry. Um, and my question is primarily to the first presenter, not only because you did mention Denmark a couple of times, but um, also because um, uh, I work in the Foreign Office and with um, International Development Corporation, and we want to change the world. We want to, to, and if you turn around, the banner behind you is also about development. So I was, I was taken by the title of your presentation, but I don't think you quite gave honor to the title in your, your presentation. Um, because the, the, I'm not an economist, I have to say. Uh, the, the, the picture you, or the measurement of inequality that you work with in your approach, in your analysis. I'm just wondering how you as an economist, because the end results that you're measuring, the quantitative data or that you presented, you know, there's a reason why this is so. And, you know, the, the, there's a context around why these uh, levels of inequality are there in the first place. And we heard from the keynote presenter this morning that, you know, you can have a government and then you can have reforms and then the picture changes. And you, you did make a reference to say you didn't want to go into the country level because of ethical reasons. Um, I would argue it has nothing to do with ethics, it has to do with politics. I come from a country where we have one government after the other and the inequality levels are very much dependent on which government we have in power. So, so it's not a taboo or anyway. This is what it's all about. It's a battlefield. Um, so I would end my, my question by throwing the ethics back to you as an economist that don't you have responsibility to somehow say, okay, this is the picture we see that you have painted in your research, but, but how does that help policymaking? How can we use such information in policy making, which is what we sometimes do in, in governments? Uh, how can it be helpful for us to, to, to whether we, we want to have more or less uh, inequality, because that's a battlefield also. Some argue that a little bit of inequality is good, and some argue the opposite. Thank you. Thank you. I think we had a question there in the middle, uh, the gentleman in the middle, the gray jacket. Sorry, with the gray jacket here. Thank you very much. My name is Muhammad. I'm from University of Helsinki. Originally, I'm from Sudan. Of course, my question goes for the data from Sudan. I would comment that the, 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 the data which you have presented, my question relates to the two speakers in the middle who present the, and then also on the polarization. The, 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 I think the, 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 the middle class which you have shown in the data of 2009 that completely disappeared from Sudan because the vulnerable group joined the poor and the middle go, goes to the vulnerable. And the last, the last group, which is, you said is like 10%, I think that has decreased, that is the richest, has decreased quite much from the 10% to 4%. And much of, 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 of the Sudanese now, like over 70%, like now becoming like poor about 26 like vulnerable and 4% only the richest and the richest goes from drop from 10 because of, of kind of struggle between the within the ruling party who are not becoming the capitalist and those are not from the wealthiest part of the society but they are politicians themselves so the only 4% of the population are the pol politicians share the whole wealth of the country. That goes also to, to, the, to the data collection concerning the government statistics and, the, and, and, and this uh, household surveys. My, 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 my worry and, and concern about if you rely on the household surveys conducted by the government, that is a false and vague thing also. Because we should have to rely on an independent institution that who conducted this household survey. It's not only the household survey that matters, rather than the government statistics, but who conducted the household survey also matters. 
because the government, if they conduct it, even the household survey, they know how to twist it, and they use it for their own statistics. The question is always those critics raised for the government, but the answer is always that it's like is globalization. This is if, if an impact of globalization. So my question relates to you, to do you both to comment on that and to the last speaker on the connection and divide between the impact of globalization and local policies on inequality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we have just a few more minutes and um, so we have time for maybe one more quick question and if there's anybody who has a question specifically on the last paper that would be I'll give you priority. No? <laughs> okay, let's ask one question in the front here from Miguel. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, my name is Miguel Nino from Union Weather. Um, my, I have two questions. I'm sorry, f not for the last presentation, but uh, for Alice and Halid and Nirajan. Um, for Alice, you know, the estimate that you present is based on Milanovic and the least data, right? And, uh, but we know that these data sources are based on household surveys which usually exclude the top or the very end of the income distribution, right? So my question is how do your resource would be biased without these critical data sources that you don't have there? The second question I have is also on your threshold that you presented, which is beyond the normative considerations, which are equally important, I wasn't sure your technical arguments behind what you said, right? So, on, and then on the second presentation is, um, I wasn't sure what was your methodology. So, um, so what is new and different from what we know from previous studies? So that's basically my question. Great. Thank you. Um, so I know there are a lot of other questions, but I'm going to stop here so that we can give our presenters a little bit of time to respond. And then I'd invite you to, to talk to the presenters over lunch and then ask them some of your, your remaining questions. But for the final presentation, um, I thought this was a really interesting presentation. All of the papers were really interesting and I'd urge you to, to download and read them if you haven't um, done so yet. But I thought the first question would actually be interesting for the, the final presenter to address as well. Um, I was struck by your, your final comment about uh, the relationship between polarization and conflict. And I wonder if there's, there's something in your analysis that could be used by policymakers to speak to, to, um, to these issues, the relationship between polarization and conflict. So um, I know everybody wants to get to lunch, and, and I, I don't want to cut short the presenters, but I'll ask the, each of the one author from each paper to speak for one to two minutes briefly. And then if you'd like to continue discussions over lunch, please do so, please come up. Okay, so let's go in order of, of presentations. Yes. Thank you for the very good questions. Um, I think there might have been a misunderstanding. It's not that I don't want to go into the ethical discussion. Uh, I very much do. Um, but I think there is differences for, or there might be differences for inequality preference at local level, so I cannot discuss these different preferences in a global set for each country. Um, I very much agree with you that uh, the importance should lie in what we can do about actual policy to change inequality. Um, and actually the paper is an attempt to address exactly that because I think the problem with measuring inequality where it does not lie is that we might address the wrong uh, areas and thus uh, have wrong policy or not sufficiently efficient policy making. Um, and I very much want to have a follow-up paper that specifically addresses the policy uh, proposals and that must be much more region-specific or even country-specific because it depends very much on the context. Um, but for, as a first step, I think it's very important to measure in, uh, inequality and uh, concentration at the top especially uh, in a way that displays the actual changes so that we... Um, can address and then look at uh, specific policy and, and yes, change the world. Um, this was connected to the question about the threshold um, that is, I agree, to some degree arbitrary. I think any kind of threshold that we want to fix is, well, maybe not arbitrary, but ideologically defined. Um, 
so the technical reason, or the, in quotation marks, technicality then, because it's still ideological, is that if we have a um, maximum of inequality of whatever uh, level that is, we, can, we, we know that we don't want to go uh, across that. We don't, we don't want to overstep that line. If that maximum is a uh, palmar volume to, of one, uh, which is the world average, coincidentally, um, that gives plenty of uh, scope to improve in half of the countries, at least, uh, inequality, um, is not as ambitious as I would like it. Uh, speaking about the maximum or minimum inequality, some people saying that inequality should not maybe be zero or very low. Um, I think it can be quite low. Um, uh, I think it could be a more ambitious target still, but as a start, it's probably a reasonable uh, measure. Um, I'll give some space to the others as well. Yeah, yeah sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, um, <clears throat> let, me, let me add address Miguel's more fundamental question be a, be a, to start off with. Uh, actually, it's, it's, if, if I had a bit more time on it, I would go back and explain the, what it is that we were doing, why it is that we were doing this. Uh, but I'll, I'll use a very simple uh, analogy. If you want to answer the question of how many poor people are there in the world today, uh, how do you answer that? Well, the UN, the world community, has agreed to use a $1.25. Now, if you believe that the $1.25 in purchasing power parity does a good job in measuring poverty, then problem solved. And everybody goes back happy, and we uh, go to September saying that poverty has been reduced by, I don't know, is it like 50 or 60 percent? mainly because of China and India. If you believe that the $1.25 is faulty, as we do, then you come up with a completely different conclusion. I did a paper with the International Poverty Center two years ago, and the results, if we use another method to account for the problems with the PPPs, then yes, there has been progress, but probably around 14%, not 60%. We are doing exactly the same by throwing out the use of PPPs to measure the middle class. By going back to the national surveys and doing what our colleague in Nigeria has done, to look at the survey itself and go back to the very same principles that we, the World Bank, for example, has put in order to decide on who is or not is not a poor person in Egypt, Syria, Sudan, and so forth. By going back to the definitions of national poverty lines, to define who is poor. Once you've defined who is a poor person and who is a vulnerable person, vulnerable to fall into poverty, that's easy because we already have the literature well developed on that. Then the real challenge is to come up with an equivalent definition on answering the question of who is uh, a middle class person. Well, that's difficult. So what we've decided to do is to focus on a question, well, who's not? And that methodology, I believe, answers that question. Had I mo had more time, I would have gotten into the more technical details. One final uh, response to Sudan. I agree with you. The Sudanese data, in particular, of all the nine countries, that is the worst. And it comes to, uh, I, mean, I mean, robustness. And, uh, but uh, I, I, we have to work with the data that we have. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, again, in the ideal world, we would have done the harmonization uh, uh, a lot of data harmonization like our colleague from the, um, has, has done in the case of Nigeria. But we believe that the error margin um, from mixing up these surveys does not really account for a huge discrepancy in terms of the results. So had I more, if we had more resources to do the harmonization, and we've talked a lot with, with the World Bank experts on that. So we believe as the methodologies are comparable, uh, then the discrepancies from uh, sampling uh, survey, uh, I mean, sa sampling frame discrepancies and others are, are not that large to account for a huge difference. But um, definitely, post 2009, the results will be different. How different? We don't know. That's that we, we did the exercise for Yemen and for Syria because we had information that would allow us to do so. In the case of Sudan, I agree with you, it would be very different, but we just don't have enough information to say by 10% to 15% or, or, or otherwise. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be very quick on both the question. The first one on quality of the data. Mm, it's uh, my answer is uh, um, basically see very similar to the, the first one. Uh, just to uh, underline the fact that uh, uh, I agree with you with the risk of uh, basing the research only of, on, on uh, government, government, governmental data. But um, in our case, there is, there is also the uh, work by the World Bank, the last survey we used for uh, uh, the analysis of polarization in Nigeria is uh, made uh, by the National Bureau of Statistics, but in accordance with, uh, under the guidelines of the World Bank. So, and, and, uh, in consideration of that, we also excluded the fact that the um, first kind of data, the one coming from the uh, first wave that we use in our analysis, the one referring to the 2003, uh, the National uh, longitude, um, Longitudinal Survey, is, uh, they, I mean, they are not... Uh, really re reliable. This is also one of the uh, reasons why we uh, decide to adopt this kind of uh, technique of uh, backward imputation in time, we can say. And um, as for the second question on uh, polarization and conflict, you are com uh, um, my answer is uh, uh, I don't know because the fact is that there is a uh, um, in the literature, uh, this uh, kind of link uh, which could be explored between polarization and conflict, for example, uh, Jose Maria Esteban, Jean-Yves Duclos, and so on, uh, which can be considered the fathers of uh, the notion of polarization in the literature, they also have in their articles, in the title of their, of their articles, the word uh, conflict. And this, co and this word is always linked to polarization, which is the main topic of the article. But um, in um, some recent papers they wrote, in particular Esteban, also they complain about the fact that uh, there is little empirical evidence on this kind of, of link. So, our next step will be to invent some kind of uh, methodology to, um, to work on this uh, kind of link. I mean, my uh, affirmation is not really correct because there are a lot of works by Collier on the, um, ten, uh, on the um, possibility to find an empirical link between uh, um, these uh, two concepts, but the efforts, and this is the major complaint uh, by the uh, fathers of uh, polarization, uh, are still limited. So we will try to uh, give uh, uh, a link between polarization and conflict in an original way. At the moment, we, uh, we, we want the results, uh, the empirical results, on the fact that uh, consumption distribution as a proxy of income distribution in Nigeria is polarized in this case. Thank you. Good. Okay, just a very quick final word. Thank you to our presenters and to the audience. Um, if you haven't done so yet, please do read these papers. They're very, they're very rich, um, rich papers, and we can only touch on some of the issues that they, they discuss in the presentations. So thank you. Please head over to lunch.